Thrive Conference Series Podcast. To find out more, go to littlemountainministries.com. 1 Timothy 3, Chapter 1. In view of that, many times when churches are appointing elders, they they say if they have the congregation involved, and that's a whole other story, I think that is a biblical example. In, in Acts chapter 6, when they came to appoint leaders or when they came with the problem of the Grecian widows, the apostles said, we're not going to the grocery store. We're not going to do it. It's not reason we should leave the word of God and serve tables. And here's what they said. You select, will appoint. Well, wait a minute. You're Peter, Andrew, James, and John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew. Jesus selected you, he taught you, and he trained you. looks to me like you ought to have more wisdom than any of the men here that have been converted since Pentecost. But they said, no, that's not the way this is going to work. You select, we will appoint. So when, when a congregation decides to do that and let the, let the church do the selection, Many times they'll say, now we would like for you to turn in the names of those men that you believe are qualified and would do a good job, but be sure and talk to them first. Now why would they want people to do that? That's it. That's it. You have to desire the job. That's, that's what people say. And my observation in the last few years, when you do that, you're probably eliminating some of the best men in the church. Now, why would I say that? Well, just kind of Bible stuff. See, I know one time that God approached a man through a burning bush, and he said, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And Moses said, but I don't desire the job. And God said, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I thought, sure, you'd want to do that, but if you don't desire the job, you can't do it. I'll check with somebody. No, he didn't do that. He said, I will be with you. And one time the angel of the Lord went to Gideon and he said to Gideon, you mighty man of valor. He said, mighty man of valor, nothing. I'm a punious kid and a punious clan and a punious tribe in Israel. And the angel of the Lord said, but I will be with you. The Lord came to Jeremiah and he said, I want you to speak to my people. And he said, I'm too young. I don't desire the job. He said, I will be with you. And so there's, there's at least three outstanding leaders who didn't desire the job, and if you can call them before they desire. But it's a qualification. I used to say that. That's the first qualification. As a younger preacher, when I would approach a man to encourage him, and he'd say, well, I don't desire the job. I said, well, I can't talk to him anymore. If you read 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, Real carefully, it says, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless. 1 Timothy 3 verse 1 is an observation, not a qualification. It's just an observation. If a man desires the office of a bishop, man, that's a really great thing if he desires that. And it is a work. It's not primarily a title or an honor for a good church attendance. We used to have Mr. Harville. It came around every month in our school, and if you had perfect attendance, you'd get a number two yellow pencil. He was our attendance supervisor. And so we get a reward for good attendance. Becoming an elder is not a reward for being good and having good attendance at church. It is a work. And if you desire to work like that, that's good. Now, if you desire that, you're desiring something good. Now, let me tell you the kind of person that needs to do that. 
And so here's what I think. If you combine that with the principle that we read in Acts chapter 6, and evidently if you want to go back to the Old Testament and find out how they selected leaders in the Old Testament, go back to Exodus 18 and Deuteronomy chapter 1. Exodus 18 says that uh, Moses chose leaders of tens, fifties, hundreds, and thousands. That's what his father, grand, uh, father-in-law Jethro said to him. Okay, so who chose them? says Moses did. Now, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 1, it will tell you how Moses chose to choose those. And Moses is speaking according to Deuteronomy 1, 1 to all Israel. And he chose all Israel to choose those men. So Moses choose, chose to let the people choose. And you know what the people said? Same, please, the whole most. Same thing they said in Acts 6. Somebody said that is the greatest miracle in the entire Bible. If you can do anything that pleases everybody, that's a miracle. But that's what it says in Acts 6 and in Deuteronomy chapter 1. You choose your leaders. Good. We think that's a great idea. Everybody's happy with that. Here's another observation on elder selection. Have you ever been in a congregation and they, they come up, whoever comes up with the list, the church or the elders or whoever, they say, here, men, that we're suggesting serve as elders. Now, you have two weeks, right? Two weeks. That's pretty well what everybody does, two weeks. Must be in the Bible somewhere. I've never heard of three weeks, one week. It's always two weeks. You have two weeks, and if anybody can up, come up with a scriptural objection, which almost comes across, these are the ones we want. Don't you dare make an objection because we think they're good. But anyhow, if you can come up with a scriptural objection, write it down, sign your name, and we won't ever tell who wrote the letter. Have you ever heard of that? So what I call that is two weeks of legalized gossip. In the book of Acts, it says that the Romans would not prosecute a man before he faced his accuser. And we're saying we're going to make a rule for two weeks. You can bring an accusation against these men and we won't ever let them know who accused them. I think Matthew 18, 15 would be a better rule. If a man sins against you, tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if that doesn't work, Take with you one or two more. If that doesn't work, bring it to the search committee and let's work it out. And so what I highly suggest is don't entertain any objections they have first talked to the person that they object to. Does that make sense? All right, let me tell you what I want to spend our time with mostly today. As I said, I am, I, I am a connoisseur of observing evaluating and improving rules. Our rules are the way we do stuff. It's our habits. That's the way we operate. Family rules are usually unconscious, unspoken, understood, and contradictory. That means we don't think much about them. We don't discuss them generally. However, if you disobey one, you are in serious trouble. And many times our rules are contradictory, and that's what causes us stress. Let me illustrate. For the last several years, when I was a younger man, I thought that uh, 55 miles an hour means drive, you know, fairly fast. But you don't, I mean, 55 is just a suggestion. So kind of watch, and if you don't see a Officer, then, you know, go as fast as you can without getting hurt. Now, when you see 30 miles, that means they slow down a little bit. And the dumbest thing I ever saw is a stop sign. Why in the world, when you can see all the way around, would you want to stop and look both ways and all you're doing is giving folks that are coming more time to catch up and hit you when you do pull out? So just kind of roll through those. Well, I read Romans 13 and it says that we're to be subject to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Not because of fear, because of conscience. It's just the right thing to do. 
if the state, if the re recognized authorities can't set the rule, then who ought to decide how fast to drive? But we have people that do that. So I became convicted, and, and especially since we've got cruise control, here's my route. You don't have to do that. Nobody has to. But I set my cruise control one mile below the speed limit. And so I just cruise down the highway. And when I see a patrol car, I don't slam on my brakes. Why would I want to do that? I'm already one mile. I'm doing 69 to 70 mile an hour speed limit. I just keep going, keep going, keep going. That's my rule. Now, I've got another rule, or maybe a set of rules, is I am cheap. I like to save money. And I, one of the books that really influenced me back about 1977, 8, somewhere along there, was Andrew Tobias's book, The Only Investment Guide You'll Ever Need. And my mustard seed out of that book is that the way most people, most people, he said, could save more money by buying in quantity and on sale than by having $10,000 in the bank and drawing interest. No, I didn't have $10,000 in the bank, so I said, I'm going to do that. So when I'd run out of uh, shaving cream, I'd find shaving cream on sale and buy a dozen cans of shaving cream. That stops inflation, you've got it on sale. Toothpaste, 12 tubes of toothpaste. So I, I like to do that, still, still look, look for sale. Here's where I get my stress. My rule is one mile on the speed limit. And I come, I'm coming up off the Cumberland Plateau and going, going down toward Dunlap. That's a pretty steep thing there. And you know what happens? My car tends to get over the speed limit. I got a rule that I don't do that. But I also got a rule that when I start slamming on my brakes, that eats up my brake pads and messes up my gas mileage. So i got a binder, and I'm not going to tell you who wins every time. But that, many times our rules cause stress. So usually they're unconscious, unspoken, understood, and contradictory. I think one of the best things that groups can do, and I like to apply principles in the family, in the church, in our business, and with softball teams. Anytime there are people coming together, if it's a biblical principle, it will work in working with people. So I highly suggest that people who are in relationship with each other think about their rules, discuss them, agree on them, and write them down. Well, where do you get an idea like that? I learned that at the University of Hard Knocks, whose colors are black and blue, and the school yell is ouch. First full-time work. Went in, just about no agreement. In fact, I sometimes work if they wonder if they really wanted me to move there. Tom Holland had been preaching at Yorkville, Tennessee for five years. And he said, Brethren, I think you are ready for a full-time preacher. And Jerry Barber is going to be graduating from Lipscomb, and I just think you all need to get him. Well, I'd preached for them one summer while Brother Holland did meetings. He had a custom of bringing in somebody for 13 weeks during the summer because he held 13 meetings during the summer. He is off all summer. So I'd already preached for him 13 weeks. But they heard somewhere, if you're going to get a full-time preacher, you're supposed to come and try out. So I had to drive down, try out. And I reckon they wanted me to come. But I didn't know what to ask. They didn't know what to ask. So I just agreed to go. I've been there about a year. And I asked them if I could have a week off during Christmas to go visit. They said, well, sure, I'd be good. I said, well, good, I appreciate that. And the Sunday before, one of the elders got up, and they, they had taken up a collection, and they gave me $30 for a Christmas present. And Gail said, Jerry, what are you going to do with your Christmas present, your $30? I said, Gail, what I'd really like to do, if it's okay with you, I'd like to buy me a new pair of Sunday shoes. I said, every time it rains, my feet just get soaked. There's holes in the bottom, and they're not worth fixing. 
She said, that would really be nice. I wish you could have a new pair of Sunday shoes. How are we going to make a car payment? I said, man, it's in the budget. That's no problem with that, Gail. We haven't had any problem. She said, they won't pay you while you're gone. I said, sure they will. She said, they won't either. I said, well, you know, everybody knows you get a week or two off of pay. She said, you wait and see. Guess who was right? Gail. I waited a week or two, and there was a check missing there the week that I was gone. So with fear and trembling, this back before I got comfortable talking about money, I said, Brian, just need to ask a question. What is your policy about a preacher taking a vacation, having a week or two vacation with pay? They say, well, I never had a preacher. We haven't got a policy. I said, well, I always thought what I've heard talking to preachers is generally they get about two weeks off with pay. And I just wondered what y'all did. And I said, you know, of course it really, you know, it doesn't make any difference to me. Just lying like everything sure makes a difference. $200 and I was making $100 a week. I mean, a hundred dollars, making a hundred dollars a week. And, uh, but I said, I need to plan ahead. What well, do you need to borrow a little money? I said, no, 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 no. I got money in the bank and I buy groceries this week, but it does make a ding in your budget. Well, what are we going to do, brother? And they talk. One of them finally came up with this original idea. He said, it didn't do nothing. Let's don't give him nothing. And they said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So that boat passed, passed without any objection. What did I learn from that? You need to really discuss stuff like that before you get started. So sure enough, I stayed there a total of 18 months. That was my first unintentional interim. Tom Holland had been driving up every weekend preaching for them. I came after him, and they paid me a little more because I was full-time and got a lot worse preaching. Never did feel like that was a good bargain. And so that with a house where you couldn't heat and eat at the same time, it had a 60-amp fuse box and a three-stack electric heater. And if you turned on this heater and the cooking stove at the same time, it blew the fuse. And we had a baby come in and didn't want to freeze the first one we got, so we decided we needed to find a warmer house, and we did. And sure enough, when I went to Madisonville, Kentucky, man, those elders, they laid everything out. You can have two weeks vacation with pay. You can hold four meetings a year. We'll pay you for that. We'd like for you to go to a lectureship. We'll pay for that. And so all that was outlined. Man, Doing good, doing good. I've been there eight years, and I was looking for another place to preach. And somebody brought up in a meeting, are we paying Jerry for running him around all over the country trying to find a job when he's not here preaching? Do we pay him every week? Trevor said, yeah, we pay him every week. Hadn't missed one yet. Well, Jerry, what about that? Is that right? And I said, yes, sir. I said, Brother Carl Price, Brother... Ed Wright and Brother E. Holly were elders, and here's our agreements. I outlined all of those. Well, two of those have died. One's resigned. Brother Holly's there. Brother Holly, you were an elder when Jerry came. What about it? Well, seemed like we talked about that, but I don't remember exactly what we said. Oh. What did I learn from that? You need to write it down. Well, back in my daddy's day, they just made a handshake. A man's word was his bond. You know what my response to that is? If that worked out for your daddy, praise the Lord. Here's my rule. The only people who do not need written agreements are people who are never going to die and never going to forget anything. And they need to be working with people who will never die and never forget anything. Otherwise, you better write it down. What I like to do is write it down, sign duplicate copies. I'm going to run it through my scanner, put it in Dropbox, sending it up to iCloud. I have three hard drives that function as my time machine. I rotate those once a month. As soon as I take that one off, I take it across to my apartment. I've got two right here, and so they're rotating once a month. And then I want to file the original, my safety deposit box, in the Bank of America on Bell, in Bellevue in Nashville, Tennessee. It's 
It isn't unspiritual to write down your agreements, right? All scripture, all the writings are given by inspiration of God. Did you know that God made duplicates before they invented Xerox in stone? So evidently writing down your agreements is not something that's unspiritual. And so I highly suggest that, uh, that we do that. Uh, elders, deacons, preachers, let me make an observation or two. Incidentally, I read this article right not long before Jerry Wayne turned 13. It was in the Reader's Digest, and the title of the article was Adult at 18. And this man said he and his wife were thinking one day their, their, their daughter's 13th birthday was coming up. They said, we've got five years to make an adult out of her. When she is 18, she can join the Army. She can vote for the President of the United States. She'll be an adult. We need to get her ready for that. Just Instead of saying the day she's 18, okay, you're an adult. Now start acting like one. We need to start transferring that responsibility. So we jotted down a number of tasks. We thought our children ought to be able to perform, and on their 13th birthday, we took them out to eat, and we introduced them to this concept, adult at 18. What should they be able to do at 18? They ought to be able to buy and take care of their own clothes. They ought to be able to uh, put themselves to bed and get up in the morning by themselves. We don't have to do that for them. And we just named several things they ought to be able to do. Of course, somewhere along there, they'll learn to drive and need to learn to take care of a car and, and how to do all those things. And so we just started doing that, and we said, what we'd like to do is take one of those at a time. And when we did that, we would write a contract. They would get a privilege and a responsibility. First thing both of them wanted to do is buy their own clothes. We had the budget. We'd still fund the money, but you got this many dollars a month, and that were back in the old days when we had Sunday clothes and everyday clothes. So they had to have a Sunday outfit, and then they had their everyday outfits. Gail's rule was, if you buy wash and wear, I'll put them in the washer and dryer and hang them up. If they're to be ironed, then you'll need to iron them. And so it was fun to shop with a 13-year-old boy who looked for cheap stuff and had a lot of polyester in it. <laughs> But we did the contracts. We did uh, telephone contracts. That was way before cell phones. So how much time can you spend on the phone and that? We had a driving contract. What happens if you get a ticket? Who pays for it? Who pays for the deductible on the insurance? What if you have a wreck? And, and what if you get a ticket? And all of those things, we had that all written down. All written down. Uh, every time, it just happened this way with me. But every time I ever had a disagreement about anything, I was wrong. Jerry Wayne got his driver's license when, in August, August 31st with his birthday. December 5th, he totaled our pickup. We were eating with some friends for breakfast one Saturday morning, got a, got a call, and Jerry Wayne said, Dad had a wreck. I said, Jerry Wayne, are you okay? Yes, sir, I'm okay. The truck looks pretty bad. I said, I'll be right there. He had somehow said somebody kindly darted at him, and he overcorrected and went down, hit a tree. And I said, well, Jerry Wayne, you know, $500 deductible, you have to pay for that. Yes, sir. I said, okay. Let's call a record. Didn't have to fuss about it. Got shaving the next morning. I said, is that right? Was it? Was it? And I went down, you know what that contract said? It said if he had an accident, I would, he would pay half the deductible and I would pay half the deductible. And I said, Jerry, why don't you go down and read your contract? He said, Daddy, you pay half of it. I said, yeah. Now, did I do that because I was trying to cheat my son? No, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot. And if you don't record it, it is easy to always think that man cheated me. If it's written down, all you got to do is read the contract, read the contract. Here's what I have found that works really well. 
If I am the supervisor, if I am the parent, if I am the elder, if I am the person who, who, is, who is going to evaluate and really have the final say on the contract, let the other person write it like they would like to have it. And then I'll write down what I would like to see it look like and let's negotiate and let them present theirs first. Just works really, really well. Instead of saying, okay, here's that, sign that. That's what you'll do. No, 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 no. Why don't we talk about how you'd like to do it? I'll talk about how I'd like to do it and let's negotiate. And, and I found that works better with parents and with elders. And I was office manager in two congregations with secretaries. I do the same thing with secretaries. And uh, I found out that worked well. I want to share with you something that uh, I was introduced to you, introduced to not long ago, that I think would help eliminate a lot of church fusses. Like I say, I've had contracts for years now. First church I didn't. My second church I didn't. Everything from here on, we've always specified everything. That's worked well. But I was introduced to the ideas of elders having a relationship agreement. And the first time I heard this being done was with a church in Nashville who had had a church fuss. And the elders got into shouting matches and what often happens during church fuss. And just acted in ways that were not Christian. And then there was another church that heard about that and they came to need one and they had one. I want to, would you hand these out, please? Yep. Shepherd relationship agreements. And so this is an eldership. Central here happens to be where I'm working. This is not exactly the relationship I get. This is, this is not exactly the relationship that they have. I'm using Central here as a generic congregation. So what I did is wrote it the way I really think it ought to be done. Number one, the purpose of this document is to confirm my commitment to the Central Church of Christ leadership and to clarify the interaction of the leadership body. Well, you don't need anything like that. We're just going to do like the Bible says. We're just going to be Christians. Yeah, but telling some people to do that is like telling a pit bull to be nice when he's aggravated. You need to clarify. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, what do you mean? It just means act like a Christian. Seems like you're getting irritated. I'm not irritated. I'm just, I'm just frustrated the way you're, oh, it's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Let me tell you where I came up with some of these concepts. Aside from learning to fly an airplane, that was my first graduate program uh, uh, class I took in graduate school. I, I designed my own post-bachelor's program. The second thing, probably where I've learned more than anything else, is in premarital counseling. When I do premarital counseling, I explore with a couple, how do you obey Genesis 2.24? For this person, for this reason, shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. How do you do that? How do you leave father and mother? I've thought about that and thought about that. The best way I found out is to go shopping in your home of origin. And so you go back, the bride goes back into the home where she grew up and she starts shopping, looking around, and the groom does the same thing. And they say, what is it that I want to move out of the home where I grew up and bring into my new home and what do I want to live, leave there? And I'm not talking about the refrigerator and the big screen TV. I'm talking about what rules, the way you all did stuff. See, every marriage, in my observation, is a mixed marriage. 
I believe two babies could be born on the same day across the street from each other, go to the same school, same church. They'll still have a mixed marriage because their family rules were different. One of the things I do in premarital counseling, one of the last sessions that I have is what we call in-law stew. Gail makes the basis for the stew. We invite the bride and her mom and daddy, groom and his mom and daddy, and we all come together. Gail cooks the meat and the, and the tomato stuff. They all bring a can of vegetables. We dump them in, warm them up. Gail's got the cornbread ready, and we eat stew, and then we go upstairs and talk about it. And we talk about how you going to do all this stuff. How are you going to treat your in-laws? See, they hadn't had any in-law problems because they hadn't got any in-laws yet. That's the best time to talk about something before you got the problem. And one of the things I do to illustrate how they come from different rules, I ask each family to describe how they do Christmas. When do you open the presents? How do you open the presents? Do you stay? Do you save the bows and paper? Do you throw it everywhere? Do you open them one at a time? See, our family rule was you look at it, you shake it, you guess, and then you open it up. Some families, you just, everybody tears in, five minutes, everybody's finished. They're just different rules. And those rules are usually unconscious, unspoken, understood, and contradictory. Well, that seemed to work pretty well. My hearing aids were a year old in December, and I went in for my one-year checkup. And one of the ladies worked in the office, and she said, Jerry, you, you did our wedding ceremony 25 years ago. And see, what I do, I have this couple to go through their rules, and they bring them back, and they discuss. See, what were your time rules? What were your money rules? What were your religious rules? What were your conflict rules? What was your dress code growing up? Just all kinds of rules. And then the next project is they, they get together now and they discuss that. What is it that we want to move into our home? And then they agree on that for six months and then they agree to reevaluate and adjust it. She said, 25 years ago, you did premarital counseling. We still got our books. And she said it would be interesting to know the number of times that we've come to, con we've come to a piece of conflict and one of us will go back and we'll get those rules and we'll say, now here's what we agreed on. Who changed the rules? <laughs> and she said, that's settled it every time. We agreed on it. Here's what, we're gonna, here's what our rules are going to be. Who changed the rules? Well, I did, but I shouldn't have. I'm sorry. See, that's, that's, that's powerful. That's powerful. And so from the premarital counseling, I started doing that in, in eldership training. And so I, in this church, incidentally, I told them they set the world's record. I mailed it out just for them to evaluate. These elders not only evaluated, they got together, they said two Sunday afternoons, and they worked it out and discussed it. They said, these are our rules. And so this is a summation of these. For instance, in a marriage, many times, for some reason, I guess God has a sense of humor in dealing with conflict, many times a shouter will marry a powder. That's two different rules of conflict. And both of them think they're right and more Christian than other. Well, why don't you talk? If you wouldn't sit there and stick your lip out down there where you could walk on it, and if you'd tell me what's on your mind, we'd get this thing settled and get it over with. But you sit there just pouting and saying nothing. And the powder's saying, if you wouldn't be so ungodly and shout at me, and you know, you, that, that, this hurts, and I get scared when you do that because in the home where I grew up, we didn't shout at each other. Willie Franklin said that he doesn't raise his voice. I can't imagine. He raised his voice when he's preaching, but he says he doesn't do it at home. But, I, you know, I, he probably knows more about it than I do. <laughs> but, I mean, that's a wonderful thing to hold it down. But other people don't do that. Here's what Margaret Marcusen says. She wrote a book called Leaders That Last. And it's really a good book on family systems. Here's what she said. When we unconsciously act from our family script, our choices are limited. It tells us how to be angry or how to hide or how to protect others. We learned our lines as soon as we learned to talk. 
Now you imagine that with a husband and wife. You've got a shower and a powder. What's going to happen? They're going to have to make some adjustments or they're not going to do conflict very well. Okay? Let's go to five or six elders. Guess what? They have different rules. And unless they grew, see what, what the relationship agreement says, here is how we will behave ourselves in this group. You don't have to do it everywhere else, but that's what we're going to do here. We promise this is what we're going to do. Number two, it is preferred that eldership decisions be made by consensus. However, if a consensus cannot be reached, decisions shall be made by majority vote. Well, I don't believe in voting. Okay, how are you going to do it? We're just going to wait till everybody agrees. Okay, what I hear you saying is that if one man objects on doing something, you're not going to do it. That's right. We're going to wait till everybody agrees. All right, I'm confused. You're telling me that one man has more godly wisdom than the four other all combined. And you're going to let him hold up the whole project. And you think that somehow God instilled more wisdom in that one man than in the other four. You'll either have majority rule or minority rule. I happen to believe that if all men are qualified and equally spiritual, it's better for majority goes ahead rather than by minority rule. So this, my suggestion would be, yeah, try to get everybody on the same page. If you can't, say we've got to vote on it. Number three, once the eldership has decided an issue, I will set aside personal preference in support of, my, of the decision. My support will be evidenced in spirit and voice and in action. Number four, if I'm not present for a decision, I will support the decision made in my absence. Number five, within the elderships, I will be lovingly frank and honest and open in expressing my personal feelings and opinions. When my fellows, fellow elders express feelings and opinions, I will listen respectfully. And my, uh, Pat Lenziani has written a number of books on business, and they are powerful. If you hadn't read him, generally what he does is tells a fable and then he makes application. He wrote a book called The Advantage. He is a consultant to businesses, and he says the kind of consulting he does, he goes into a business, he said, I don't want to see their product, I don't want to see their spreadsheets, I don't want to see their profit and loss. What I want to do is to attend several of their meetings and see how much conflict they have during those meetings. If they have no conflict or very little conflict. That is a dysfunctional group. During the decision-making process, everybody needs to speak freely and with enthusiasm. Every idea that they think and make every objection and every suggestion they can come up with so that they can get the feeding of the best opinions of the group. And then whoever's in charge, CEO or committee or whatever, they make the decision. Everybody walks out. Not everybody gets away, but everybody's had their say. And he said, that is a healthy group. Somehow we have uh, in some congregations equated unity with never disagreeing with anybody over anything. That's, that's not the way you do it. That's not the way you do it. Number six, I will respect the confidentiality of matters discussed within the eldership. We often call it the rule that what we say here stays here. Well, what do you do? What do you do if you're an elder? Do you tell your wife what's going on in the elders' meetings? I went to two Christian colleges, Freed Hardman three years, Lipscomb one year. During those four years, I had 50 minutes instruction on how to deal with people. Brother Elvis Hufford came into one class of preacher and his work that Brother Woodson taught and talked to us about counseling. I don't remember anything he said. So I was flying with the seat of my pants for several years. And when people would come to me, I thought I ought to tell them something, so I'd say what we say here stays here. However, my wife and I are one, and if I feel a need to tell my wife, I'll tell her that. And I tell people, usually folks talk about baseball and weather after I gave them that. And the only time I'd ever talked to my wife about anything when I was scared to death 
I said, Gail, you won't believe what's going. Did you know that this family is having this trouble? I'd first ask Gail, can I tell you and you not tell anybody? And she'd always say yes, and I think she always kept that. It took me several years to realize that I was asking Gail to do something that I was unwilling to do, and that is to be the end of the food chain. And that wasn't really fair for her. See, if I can tell one more person because it's got me excited, why can't she tell one person, one of her best friends, and then tell her, and guess what? It'd be like one church. They had an unwritten rule, but it wasn't written, but it was conscious. They had a rule for communication. And this was a large church, over 1,000 people. The rule for this church, and I had several people tell me this, if you want everybody in this church to know something, go to the, ask the elders if you can come in and talk to them on Wednesday night. Tell them something and say, don't tell anybody. What we say here stays here, and everybody in the church will know by Sunday morning, and it would happen. I know at least one elder, he'd tell his wife, and she was a spreader of the news. And so my high recommendation is, don't tell your wife the confidential stuff. Some of the best credibility that I've ever gained is when somebody comes and talks to me about some serious thing that's going on in their life. And then sometime later, they'll approach Gail. And they'll say, Gail, you know, we have this. I'm sure Jerry's talked about it. And she said, I have no idea what you're talking about. She said, well, he said he didn't tell anybody. She said, he doesn't. Now, if you don't talk to me, that's fine. I'll keep it, but I don't know what you're talking about. Huh? Okay. That's what he said. Here's what I've told elders. I don't know how much experience you have. Have you ever known of an elder's wife who couldn't keep confidences and spread stuff? I don't know. You've heard about that. So I tell elders what you can do. If you really trust your wife, you've got five or six other elders. I trust my wife. I don't know if I trust yours or not. So I'm going to tell my wife, but I hope you won't tell yours because I don't know if I'd trust her. Now, how's that going to play out? Probably not too good. Probably not too good. Well, how does an elder get any, 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 somebody can bounce stuff off? What I suggest is find a good friend, preferably in another town that you trust and that you can call them up and tell them any situation you're working on Hopefully they don't know the people, but you don't have to call the name. Here's the situation. How would you handle this? And so you have confidentiality. You have another person to put input, and there's no way of spreading it because they don't know who you're talking about. When people come out telling you what went on in elders' meetings, especially of a confidential nature, you got trouble in the church. I can tell you what's going on in a church where there's a lot of conflict. Gossip. Proverbs 26, 20. Where there's no wood, the fire goes out. Where there is no tail bear, contention ceases. And uh, often that happens. I will refrain from making major decisions on my own, realizing I have no authority as an individual Elder, final authority resides in the eldership as a whole. I will not speak for the eldership without their approval. Uh, treat my fellow elders with respect as an equal. Observation, most new elders are not really elders. They're elder trainees. They're junior elders. And they have to serve a probation period. This says, now we're going to let her. Number nine, I will not speak in a negative, critical spirit concerning any elder or the eldership, any deacon, any staff member. I will speak in a positive spirit about the leadership or not speak at all. I'd been preaching 50 years when I got the anonymous criticism clause in my contract. Now, every place where I go, here's a clause that goes in the contract. All criticism of Jerry Barber will go directly to Jerry Barber and he will welcome it. Jerry Barber does not accept anonymous criticism. And so somebody comes up to you, a lot of people are upset, Jerry. A lot of people who are upset. Well, who are they? Well, I can't tell you. It's confidential. Sorry, I can't listen to that. My contract says I don't listen. Tell them to come talk to me. That's Matthew 18, 50. Tell them to come and talk to me. I 
I recognize the need for the eldership ministerial staff to function as a team. I commit to meeting regularly with the elders, ministerial staff, for study purpose of study, prayer, and mutual shepherding, discussion of congregational shepherding issues to address congregational policy and decisions. Uh, let me run down here to another one that I just think is really, really important. Number 13. When I'm deciding to resign my role as a shepherd of this congregation, I will give a three-month notice to the leadership group before announcing it to the congregation. This is what I call the no suicide contract. I suggest when an interim ministry, before your preacher, when you select your new preacher, uh, that's the reason I'm here for you to select a new preacher. When you select a new preacher, you ask him two questions before he preaches first sermon as your full-time preacher. Number one, how long would you like to stay working with this congregation? Number two, how do you plan to leave? If you find a place that you like better, how much notice would you give us? And if we have a long-term relationship, would you give us the courtesy of coming and discussing that before we sign the contract? We just kind of like to know. Number two, if we, in our wisdom that hired you, in our wisdom, if we think it might be better for you or us for you to go, how would you leave in that situation? Some preachers ruin their ministry by throwing a fit on the way out. Not only do preachers do that, sometimes elders do that. One of my interim churches, one Sunday night, an elder got up. He had had it up to here, and he resigned. He nodded to his wife, and they walked out the back door, and within about three weeks, 60% of the church had walked out the back door. That hurts. Suicide is horrible. I had a granddaddy committed suicide, an uncle committed suicide, a first cousin that committed suicide. I spent the last night with my granddaddy before he killed himself. I was 10 years old. That hurts my feelings. But leadership suicide is also hurtful in a church, in a business, and on a softball team. And so if we're going to make a transition, it may be health, it may be work, it may be you're moving, it may be you're just burning, whatever it is, let folks know ahead of time and have them, have them make an agreement on that. Now, I tell people there are two reasons I would not hold a person accountable for that. Number one, if a person has the most frequent symp first symptom of heart trouble, I would not expect him to do that. Does anybody know what the most frequent first symptom of heart trouble is? Sudden death. <laughs> That's what I've been told. You ever go to the funeral home? Well, you know, I didn't know he had any heart. No, he had never had any heart trouble. Yeah, that's, that's one of the most frequent first symptoms of heart trouble. You just die. That's the reason they call that thing the widow maker. You get a clog in there and you're gone. So if that happens, we're not, you know what? He promised he'd give us three months notice and he lied. No, he didn't. He couldn't, no way he could have told you that. Number two, if you get run over by a Big Mac truck, I wouldn't expect you to give a three month notice. Other than that, let's talk about it. Let's talk about how to make a real good transition. Okay, some of those are self-explanatory. Turn it, turn it over on the back. What that is is a picture of the agreement at the Hilldale Church of Christ in Clarksville, Tennessee. What they did is they agreed on these rules. They signed them. That is, those are framed there at every entrance where you go into the church building and outside the elder's office so that every member of the church knows how their elders have agreed to work with each other. Our elders at Central and McMinnville agreed on, on the similar. I've, I've changed a little wording, but essentially this set of rules, and they made copies, and everybody in the church has access to a copy of this. And so if one elder starts talking bad about another, wait a minute, wait a minute, it says here that y'all not going to do that. See, that brings us in to the issue that if a situation is chronic, if it's a bad thing that's been going on for a long time, it's because everybody likes it the way it is more than what it would take to change it. And so the whole group is part of holding everybody accountable. Wait a minute. It says here, 
You talking about the preacher that way? It says here you won't do that. Have you talked? What did he say when you talked to him? Well, I didn't talk. Well, here's what you agreed to do. I think you need to rethink what you're doing. I heard you talk in a very derogatory way about our preacher, and you hadn't even talked to him about it. And you agreed to do this. Brother, when are you going to? I talked to one elder one time. He was talking about a preacher. And uh, I say, what did he say when you talked to him about it? Well, I didn't talk to him about it. When are you going to do it? When he comes and talks to me. I said, well, that would be good. Matthew 5 said, you know, if you know him. But Matthew 18 says, you will talk to him. When do you plan to do that? He said, well, I could right now. I said, that sounds like about the best time to do that. So there's a tool that I think is powerful, powerful. If I can be helpful to you at any time, give me a call. Any questions, comments, criticism. Thank you for being here. Thrive Conference Series Podcast. To find out more, go to littlemountainministries.com.